All right. All right. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Mark Geary. I'm Head of Communications for Beaumont Health. Thanks for joining us today. I'm joined here by Dr. Nick Gilpin, our Medical Director of Epidemiology and Infection Prevention. We just wanted to get everyone together today to provide a brief update on where things stand for Beaumont Health and also to share some words of wisdom and advice before the holidays. And then we'll be welcome to take all of your questions as they come in. So I'll turn it on over to Dr. Gilpin. Thanks, Mark. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Dr. Nick Gilpin. Um, I'm an infectious disease doctor. I'm also the medical director for infection prevention for the Beaumont Health System. Uh, I'm currently coming to you from my office at uh, Royal Oak Beaumont. I want to give a quick update on some numbers. We're going to talk numbers um, statewide, um, county level, Beaumont level, and then we'll get into a little bit more of the, uh, of the nuance. So for starters, um, across the country right now, we're seeing, you know, an extraordinary amount of COVID, more than 120,000 new cases per day. That's a seven-day average. That number has actually increased about 1.5% over the last week. Um, so things are certainly going in the, in the wrong direction from a, from a nationwide perspective. Statewide, we are a little bit more stable. Our, uh, our community test positivity is around 16%. And at the county level, Oakland County at around 13.7, Macomb County around 18.3, and Wayne around 13.2, those test positivity numbers are relatively stable over the last three to four weeks, which may sound like a good thing, but in reality, those numbers are still indicative of really quite high community level transmission, very widespread transmission. Um, at Beaumont, our latest numbers show that we have approximately 580 patients across eight hospitals. That number also is stable over the last few days, uh, but again, still indicating a very significant amount of COVID uh, within our healthcare system. That is a slight decrease from the numbers we saw about a week ago when we were over 600 patients. Looking at the breakdown of vaccinated to unvaccinated patients in the hospital, this has been sort of a, um, an important narrative throughout this whole discussion. Around 23% of our patients that are hospitalized with COVID are vaccinated, meaning the other 77% or so are unvaccinated. And that number is fairly um, solid when you look at uh, inpatients, ICU admissions, and ventilated patients as well. Now, I just wanna let everybody know that our data with regards to vaccinated versus unvaccinated uh, does not take into account booster doses. So when I say someone is vaccinated, what I'm saying is that they've had either two doses of the mRNA vaccine or one dose of the J&J &J vaccine. And when I see these patients and when my colleagues see these patients who are vaccinated in the hospital, they typically fall into three categories. These are typically older adults for whom we know the vaccine is less likely to be effective. They're immune compromised, um, meaning the vaccine is less effective or they were folks who were vaccinated early on and they may not have yet been boosted. And so we know that there's a tendency for vaccine protection to wane over time. Now I wanna get into a little bit about Omicron because that's uh, certainly been dominating some of the headlines lately in, in many parts of the world, including the United States. We know that Omicron does appear to spread more easily. Uh, it has many more mutations in the in a part of the virus that makes a connection with the cell, so it, it is more easily transmissible. We know that it has become the dominant strain in parts of the world, such as South Africa and the UK, and it's poised to become the dominant strain here in the United States as well. It's not yet clear if Omicron is causing more severe disease yet. We still have a little bit more to learn. Uh, but there are some anecdotal reports of milder illness in parts of the world where Omicron is the dominant strain. And that is also occurring in areas where there's either high numbers of prior COVID infection or vaccination. So it could be that we're seeing less severe disease in parts of the world because there is collectively some 
protection among the society. Now, according to the CDC, who tracks this fairly closely, but there is a little bit of a data lag, uh, the week ending December 11th, Omicron was approximately two to three percent of all cases of COVID. Delta made up the balance. Now there are some reports coming out from the CDC that Omicron is really surging in all parts of the country, including in the Midwest and our area. I even read a report this morning that Omicron is uh, accounting for as much as 90 percent of new cases of COVID here in the Midwest. So all of that is sort of what I'm going to call the bad news. Now I'm going to say what I think is hopefully the good news, and that is that we have some evidence that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines um, both are saying that their booster doses will boost antibody levels and provide protection. So the boosters do appear to be effective at mitigating uh, disease related to Omicron and related to other strains of COVID as well. It's certainly not a guarantee that you may not get sick, uh, but it's a, a much lower chance of getting severe disease, severe illness, hospitalization, and of course, death. Those are the things that we uh, definitely wanna prevent. So to anybody that's listening right now, I guess the message here is that, you know, we're all getting pretty sick and tired of COVID. We may be done with COVID, but it's pretty clear that COVID is not done with us just yet. So the best protection I think as of right now is to make sure you're getting vaccinated, um, to um, have that conversation with the people around you who may not yet be vaccinated, encourage them to get their vaccine. If you have not yet been boosted, I think now is the time to get boosted, especially as we're coming into the holiday season. I know there's going to be a lot of holiday gatherings. I, I certainly wouldn't really expect anything else at this point. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you not to have your holiday gatherings. Instead, I'm going to tell you to do your gatherings as safe as possible. And so for me, that means doing what I call all the things, that's masking, social distancing, hand washing, stay away or stay home if you're sick. Um, there, there is some consideration to testing uh, before you travel. If you're gonna be traveling on an airplane or if you're gonna be traveling a great distance, it may be wise to get tested before you travel. Uh, it may also be wise to test you know, repeatedly. Uh, I've seen some uh, recommendations from other epidemiologists that are encouraging people to test um, often you know, throughout the holidays, every few days or so, uh, particularly if you're traveling. Now, I, I will caution, it can sometimes be difficult to find these tests, but if you do have access to tests, um, I think that's certainly a, a good way to, to make sure that you're not potentially spreading COVID to your loved ones and your relatives. And another thing I wanna mention is that we need to think around the holidays about the people in our lives who are the most vulnerable. And we should plan our holiday gatherings and get togethers based on who those vulnerable individuals might be. Plan your activities around that person. So for example, if you've got an older individual that you're gonna be getting together with, or maybe some unvaccinated individuals, um, then I think you need to make sure that you're taking extra precautions around those, those people maybe try to prioritize some outdoor activities if that's a possibility, make sure you're wearing your mask, keeping your distance, make sure you're all getting vaccinated. So I do think there are some things we can do to have a safe and happy holiday. I, I certainly wanna to try to bring a message of hope around this time of year, and I, and I know we are all quite exhausted. Um, I don't think anyone is more exhausted, frankly, than us at the hospitals, the doctors and the nurses, and we're gonna to continue to do everything we can to keep ourselves safe and we're gonna keep doing everything we can to keep our patients safe also. And I'll leave it there. All right, thank you, Dr. Gilpin. Um, we'll now take some questions from reporters. If you have a question, you can raise your hand and we'll go from there. Robin. Um, the, the, I, I'm interested in the at-home tests and the distribution of those free of charge in Michigan. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, is that happening? Is the hospital doing it? And truly how critical would be, would at-home testing be right now as we try to fence this in? It seems like it'd be super important, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, I 
So for starters, I think that that's a, that's a public health initiative. That's not really something that the hospital is participating in. We're not distributing at-home tests to patients. Um, from, from my perspective as an infectious disease doctor, as someone who's trying to get a, a message of safety out to the public, I do like this idea. I, I do wish that at-home tests were more readily available because I think that could be a game changer, especially around this time of year when people are traveling. You could test before, you could test after, you could test during. Um, it makes it certainly much easier for a person to get a test if they start to develop any symptoms without having to then leave the house potentially put other people at risk by going to a testing location. So all those things are, are really, I think, good parts of doing at-home testing. I think we have to make sure that at-home testing is, is good testing. Uh, so we have to make sure that we're using tests that are, that are validated, tests that have good um, accuracy. Uh, I think that's gonna be a difference maker. Now, I, I will tell a, a brief personal story um, uh, of a friend who recently um, started to develop symptoms and was really had a difficult time finding places to get tested. Uh, because I think that right now, a lot of testing sites are overwhelmed and I think at-home tests are very difficult to find. So I'm certainly all in favor of making testing more easily accessible from a public health perspective. Can I, can I follow up since there's not a lot of hands? Of course. Um, I, I live down by the state line and in Ohio, you can go to a library and get a free at-home test. You can go to the rec center. You can go to union halls. It just doesn't seem like that's happening in Michigan. Have we messed this up? Should Is there a way to have done this or, or have made this happen? It's a tricky question, Robin. So, you know, again, not a public health guy here. I think that would be a good question to ask someone who's more in the public health sphere and, and try to understand some of the, the reasons for, you know, why or why not testing has been made more available. Thanks for taking the question. Yeah. Thanks for having uh, Lauren. Yeah, hi, Dr. Gilpin. My question um, kind of relates to a comment that you made. You said, you know, no one is probably more tired of COVID than the doctors and nurses in the hospital. Um, for you guys right now, does Beaumont have any kind of program to help you guys deal with this and your mental health and what you're going through? And then, um, you know, kind of just what's that experience like at this point when you see all these people coming in, 77% of them unvaccinated still, um, and then having to take care of them knowing that they didn't do what you've been asking them to do all along? Well, I, thank you for the question, Lauren. I have to say it, it feels a little bit grim at times. Um, and, and I think that, um, well, for, for starters, to the first part of your question, yes. I, I think many hospitals, including Beaumont, have set up um, access points to, you know, you know to, to have touch bases with staff, physicians, nurses, um, to really make the conversation around mental health um, uh, more accessible for people. We, we have hotlines we can call. We have um, ways that we can get in touch with a mental health professional if, if we're starting to feel overwhelmed. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that those resources are available to people like myself and my colleagues. Um, to the other part of the question, as I started to say, it, it's grim. Um, and I think a lot of us are burned out and tired. Um, you know, and, and I, I find it difficult sometimes to understand just how so many of us can, can be so sanguine, you know, about a virus that's, you know, killed more than a million people. And, um, and, and I, I, I guess what it goes back to perhaps is the, the idea of risk, right? And, and people kind of do their own risk assessments um, for better or for worse. And with the numbers being what they are, I suspect many of us have probably never um, known anyone personally who has died of COVID. Um, many of us may not even know anybody that knows anybody that's died of COVID. And so when you when you multiply that across a population, there's a lot of people out there that still, I believe, think that this virus is really not all that significant. And I would just add to that that you wouldn't necessarily know that this virus is causing severe disease unless you had a firsthand look inside of one of our hospitals. You know, one of the, the favorite things that I've heard throughout this whole pandemic is, you know, look at this place or look at that place. They don't have any restrictions at all. People don't wear masks and they really don't seem to have very much COVID. And I would always say to those people, well, how do you know? 
unless you're going to the hospital, really ground zero, you wouldn't necessarily know that because COVID is not a disease where people are going to be falling over in the streets. So, you know, having a, a, a conference like this and trying to push this information out to the public is, is my attempt to get that remaining 40% or so of unvaccinated and get them to understand that this is a serious disease and it's a serious preventable disease. And I want people to do everything they can to keep themselves safe and keep the people around them safe. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Gelpin. Uh, Danielle. Hi, um, thank you. I'm Danielle Salisbury from MLive. Um, I just have a couple questions about uh, monoclonal antibody treatments. I just, it seems like there's a lot of demand for those now. And just where the hospital, the hospital, your Beaumont stands with those. And then what it sounds like that what, what we've been using won't be effective against Omicron. So I just wondered how you guys might be preparing for that. And if you could just briefly explain the value of those treatments, I'd appreciate it, please. You got it, Danielle. So you know, monoclonal antibodies have been a, a really a great tool in the fight against COVID, particularly for people who are at risk for severe disease. So older individuals, people with chronic medical conditions, people with compromised immune systems. If they get sick with COVID and we can catch them early on, we can do these monoclonal antibody treatments to sort of stimulate their immune system, to give them some protection and hopefully um, alter the trajectory of their illness and, and keep them out of the hospital. And studies have found that these monoclonal antibody treatments, of which there are a few different varieties, they are quite effective at doing just that, at keeping people out of the hospital and shortening the duration of people's illnesses. Now, Beaumont has some infrastructure for monoclonal antibodies. I will um, start by saying that that's not something I'm intimately involved with. I have colleagues um, who are sort of um, monitoring and assessing the demand and, uh, and, and making some of the, um, uh, the therapeutics available to people. We have a few different sites within Beaumont uh, where we're able to administer monoclonal antibodies, including the Royal Oak Hospital where I'm at right now. And I will also say that demand has been incredibly high. And so there is a bit of a supply demand mismatch. Um, and much of what hinders us on the supply side is staffing. Just like everything else right now, staffing is, is a challenge. Uh, but we're trying to work around those challenges and we're trying to get this treatment into the hands of people that need it the most because it is effective. Now to your question about whether these treatments will be effective against Omicron, I think that's still an open question. And I lean very heavily on the science, uh, the people at the FDA and the NIH to, um, you know, to be assessing these things you know, rapidly and, and giving us that information as quickly as possible so that we can make sure that the treatments that we're delivering are in fact effective treatments. Thank you, Dr. Gilpin. Anyone else have a question? Uh, please raise your hand. Lauren, do you have another question or is your hand still up from before? No, apparently I'm just bad at Zoom calls. <laughs> okay, no <laughs> problem. Does anyone else have a question? Anything else, Dr. Gilpin, that, that you'd like to add or, or share? I know you and I, when we were talking about doing this news conference today, this kind of a question of what is going to finally get through to people. Um, I know that you have felt that personally and some of your colleagues have felt that as well. Is, is there anything you want to say about that? It, it feels like we've kind of said these, these same things for a while now. Just that, Mark, I, I think you said it. I, you know, I, we've we've had a lot of discussions and I, and I appreciate all of you um, in the news media coming here to help get this message out. I am I'm open to suggestions, you know, frankly, if there's, if there's anything that I can say or do or that will help make people understand because it really does feel like we're preaching to the choir right now. And, and, and I, I want this to be useful information to people in whatever way I can do that. Thank you. All right, any, any la last call for questions? Does anyone have, have any questions at all?
Oh, all right. Um, we've got a text message. Can you talk to us a little bit about the emergency center and kind of what that is like? That's from WWJ. Sure. Um, I think what you'll find right now, if you go to any emergency center, um, you know, Beaumont or any other healthcare system uh, that you may visit, you're going to find incredibly long wait times and you're going to find a very busy uh, staff. Uh, you know, and I don't know specifically what those numbers are. I just know that, that we're all very busy right now. Um, and, and that's a, a feature of exactly what we're experiencing with COVID. Uh, you know, it's a lot of people coming to the emergency rooms with symptoms. So what we're trying to do uh, as thoughtfully as possible is really triage people or get the message out to the public that there are many other ways to get COVID tested, right? There are, there are pharmacies and there are urgent care centers and there are other sites in the community, even public health sites that are offering testing. So we really urge people to not come use our emergency centers just for the purpose of testing, um, certainly, if you are sick and if you're having severe symptoms, severe shortness of breath, chest pain, and you need to be evaluated, obviously, we want you to come to our emergency centers and we will do everything we can to make sure you're seen in a timely manner. You know, but, but this is just the challenge that comes along with working in a, in a hospital during an incredibly busy time. The holidays are usually a busy time. And then you throw uh, a respiratory pandemic on top of that. It only makes things worse. You add staffing challenges to that, it only makes things worse. So just trying to get people into the appropriate level of care uh, to, to get the care that they need, I think really that's the move right now. Thank you very much. All right, last call for questions and then we'll wrap this up. If you have a question, raise your hand. All right, it looks like we've answered all the questions. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Gilpin, for your time, and I hope everyone has a nice holiday. Likewise, thank you.